He just wanted to spend some time letting you know uh, about his candidacy for president of LPC. I'm going to turn the meeting over to him. It's carte blanche. She's ready for any kind of questions you may have for him or anything you'd like to hear from him. So, oh, uh, one other thing. If you don't want to use the little kids' washrooms because they're about this high, go upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> they have adult ones upstairs. I think we have one. Well, thanks very much for I feel like uh, Don, and, and thanks to all of you for, for coming out. Um, what I'm here for is, is really for two reasons. Uh, the one Don mentioned is, is, is the obvious one. I'm a candidate for the LPC presidency, and um, I'm looking for, for a delegate. It's, the decisions are going to be made by delegates at the convention or the biennial convention or in, in January. I would like to see that change so that like the leadership became one person, one vote, because I think you know, people who can afford to go to a convention aren't necessarily representative of the, uh, of the party. But anyway, this, this race is under the current constitution and, 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 and so be it. But probably more important, I want this trip to learn. Uh, you know, I'm an Eastern Urban Riding President. Um, uh, I, uh, I need to, yeah. On, on this trip, I'm spending a lot of time in rural ridings because I need to understand the situation in, in rural ridings, and I need to understand the situation, the, the reality on the ground in, in rural ridings, suburban ridings, urban ridings, in all regions of the country, because they're, they're, they're all different, and, uh, and the president should know that. On this, on this trip, anybody who wants to be president should know that, should, should understand the ridings. Um, on, on this particular swing, 30 days, I'm, I'm talking to people from 80 ridings uh, through, through Western Canada. There will be an Eastern trip coming up, Quebec, uh, Central Canada. So I actually hope to have uh, had some good discussions uh, and good exchange of ideas in about 60% of the ridings in the country by the time that the convention rolls around. As long as Suzanne is <laughs> six, 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 Suzanne, Suzanne is my partner. And uh, the very important role she plays in this meeting is she takes the notes. She doesn't take notes on what I say, but she, she'll take notes on what you say because I need to. She doesn't take notes on your answers so we can check later. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so, so that's why I'm here. Um, you know, the obvious first question that, that, that anybody wants to know is, is why I'm running. And, uh, you know, I'm, I passionately believe that Canada needs a renewed Liberal Party. Um, uh, one of the other questions that you'll be asked is, is my view on, on um, uh, that I'm always asked is my view, my view on merger, and so I'll, I'll just answer it while I'm saying that, and, and that is um, I'm not in favor of a merger at this time. The Liberal Party would be a, um, the junior partner in any such thing, any, any such uh, merger, just like the progressive conservatives were the junior partner in the merger with the alliance, and, and, no one, and they basically disappeared without a trace. And I don't want to see Canada um, become a um, uh, divided into such that the, the only choice voters have is between an ideologically driven party on the right and an ideologically driven party on the left. That's not a recipe for success in the 21st century world as far as I'm concerned. So I'm passionate about rebuilding the Liberal Party um, and, and to be a, a credible alternative government by the next election. We may not win, but we should be at least a credible alternative uh, by, by that time. Um, Canada needs that, needs a, a liberal-led government to thrive in the 21st century and to restore its stature in the world. As a, as a former foreign service officer, it just pains me how much it lost in the last five years. Sorry, I'm speaking too low, probably. <laughs> okay? Um, I got In my analysis, the, the, um, the, the uh, May 2nd electoral debacle happened because the voters didn't view us as a credible alternative government in that, in, you know, at that time. So the next four years are our last chance to get our act together in the party. If we, don't, if we don't do that and we go down further, I don't think there's any coming back. It's, it's, it's really my honest view. 
change. So we need to we need to renew ourselves. We need to get our act together. That means some deep change, and change is a problem. I've I've been uh, I've been advocating. Uh, you know, I saw the problems five years ago. I'm sure many of you saw the problems five years ago. Before. I've been speaking out about those problems for, for five years and proposing constructive um, solutions, which, which, which I'll speak of. We need some profound cultural and, or, and, and organizational changes. Um, change, as I said, change is hard. It requires some visionary leadership. Um, you know, I, I believe I have that along with the necessary drive and the necessary experience to, to, to do that change. Uh, it has to be done. It has to be done well. And it has to be done starting young. If you look at, if you look at my track record, um, the pamphlet will give you a link to my, uh, to my uh, website. You'll see a lot, of, a lot of ideas in there, a lot of substance in there. I, I hope when you uh, when you you'll look at that and and I hope you'll 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 agree that I'm I'm the guy for the job. Where where I come from, you know, I'm an army brat. I uh, ended up at Queens for my undergraduate degree in social sciences. I went directly from Queens. I was hired directly to be a foreign service officer. So as I say, I've represented Canada abroad diplomat uh, diplomatically. Um, I knew from my army brat, brat background that I didn't want to raise a kid in the rotational service, so I knew it was going to be a, you know, a temporary spell. Um, really, really enjoyed it, really learned a lot. Uh, went back to settle in Kingston to raise a family. Uh, went back to Queens for a master's in computing science. Started a, a software development firm uh, after graduating. Ottawa was the logical market from Kingston because it was too small a community for that. So, so it was a federal government consulting practice. I went from uh, software development to project management to strategic planning. The project management is, is, uh, is quite relevant to the, the job that needs to be done. Uh, yeah, um, I, I took on increasingly large government projects. This was actually back with Foreign Affairs. Uh, as, a, as an outside contractor, but as uh, with Foreign Affairs again, as a, a signet project, two hundred fifty-six million dollars, five years to move uh, to move uh, Department of Foreign Affairs from the, the quill pen stage of diplomacy to modern, you know, online um, secure uh, networks at every one of our one hundred fifty missions abroad, um, a secure network. We didn't have. They're still using it. It was successful. I delivered it on time and under budget. We've never had WikiLeaks in Canada. <laughs> no, it worked. But what's important is is that my biggest challenge was the cultural and organizational change for completely revamping the way a very traditional, tradition-bound, uh, widely scattered organization worked. And there's there, there's relevance to the Liberal Party there. Widely scattered, tradition bound needs to change. So you know, I, I know how to do that. I became an active liberal during that period because I couldn't have been, I wasn't able to be political while I was in the Foreign Service um, uh, member, policy committee member, policy director, and eventually uh, uh, riding president in, uh, in Kingston and the islands. Um, so so that's 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 who who I am. Um, my thing, my, the way I do, I approach any task is, what's the problem? Figure out what the problem is. Where do we want to be by a certain period of time? Plan how to get there from here. And not just plan, but execute that plan. You know, uh, make it happen. Um, you'll, you'll find on my website a, a um, a four-year strategic plan that I drafted in the month of May after the uh, after the election uh, results on how we should how I think we need to go about rebuilding the Liberal Party over the next four years. Um, uh, I never pretend to have all the answers. I put it out there as a discussion draft um, because there is, you know, as I go along, I'm getting other ideas that can be, can be uh, woven into that uh, that fabric. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the job of the president because
because there's a lot of mis misconception about that job. Uh, and, and if you're going to choose the next president, you need to understand what the job is. Um, in fact, I could draw an analogy between, between a, let's say, a large corporation or other organization um, that is, needs a new CEO at a time of crisis. Um, first of all, they have a job description. We don't. Uh, they'd strike a search committee uh, that would then, uh, based on the job description and where they believe they need to be in a certain period of time, um, come up with some objective criteria for, for, a select, for assessing all of the candidates. And then they would make a rational decision. Nobody's going to be perfect. But who, has the, who is most likely of their potential candidates to get them where they, uh, where, where they need to be? It's not a popularity contest. Um, a lot is made of the need for the next president to have uh, a, you know, a really strong public profile. I disagree. The, the president of the Liberal Party is not the public face of the party. The president doesn't speak for the party on matters of policy. The, uh, that's the job, properly and constitutionally, the job of a leader. Um, uh, who, in, who in here is uh, who here is a riding president? Do we have any riding presidents in the room? No, the CCM president's not here. In fact, I don't think anybody on the board is here. You've got quite a lot of past candidates and MPs in the room. Okay, so so past so I'll draw an, an analogy. Uh, I believe that the, a healthy relationship between the uh, national president and the leader is very similar to a healthy relationship between a running president and a candidate. Now, those relationships also aren't always healthy. But in, in a healthy relationship, it's a real partnership. The, uh, the candidate's job is to win the next election or try as hard as possible to do so. It's not always, you know, it's. it's it's, it's not always feasible. The, the riding president and the board should have a longer view. Uh, any, any kind of planning starts from an honest appraisal of if things go well nationally and we get the right leader and we have the, the right candidate locally and uh, we run a good campaign, okay? How long would it take realistically to to have an even chance of winning in this riding, given the history of this riding, the people and the attitudes and everything else. And, you know, in some ridings, it could be the next election. In, in other ridings, it could take three electoral cycles. But, <laughs> I know. You're not heard it. <laughs> I'm in a little, yeah, I've, I've had people say four, right? But, if you're going to be in the game at all, you have to be an optimist. But you have to be a realistic optimist, and you have to start from where you are today. And if you, can, if you have a realistic assessment, then, then develop a plan. You know, in three election cycles, we're going to win. And these are the things we have to do to get there starting now. If you don't have that plan, you'll never get there. Okay, that's that, that's the bottom line. The the party is the same. The the national president shouldn't be out on power, spouting off on look what liberal policy should be on power and politics. Um, does anybody know the name of the president of the Conservative Party of Canada? Does it matter? Does that party run well? Right? So the leader is out there as a public face. The president needs to be well known to the members. The president needs to represent the members. The president needs to build up the party. The president needs to play. Okay? The leader is out there. And, and that's an important, it's an important distinction. But the president, that's why the president isn't, right? Um, in terms of the public face. The president is responsible for. Uh, leading member engagement, making it a party that people want to belong to, that people want to volunteer, that people want to give donations, uh, that a party that, that hears them, 
that acts on what they have to say, that represents their values. Uh, in the old days, you wanted a president who was a who was a either a really well connected corporate lawyer or a senator, somebody with with a high who knew everybody who could bring in the big corporate donations. That's that's history. That will never happen again. Now, the, the, you know, we can improve our fundraising techniques somewhat, but that will only take us so far unless members feel committed, let members feel valued, members. Members, you know, members get increasingly involved rather than disengaged, and hence want to give more. That's the only way we're going to to build up the level of donations that the conservatives have. Um, the conservatives actually give value to their members. Their members are, you know, their core membership is quite right wing, and they deliver. They're delivering a right wing uh, country. Right? Um, we got to stop that and take it the other way. So we have to give our members, make our members, give them not just make them feel, but but give them the reality that belonging to the Liberal Party gets you somewhere. That's the president's real job. The president has to be strategic, look out there, plan our rebuilding, and as I say, represent the members. This time around, the president. That hasn't happened in recent years because everything has been centered around the leader and the leader's circle of advisors. Were, and the, the party apparatus has been sort of, you know, and, and the president of the national board has been bump on the log of the, of, of the leader's office. We can see where that's gotten us. People don't feel that their voices are, are ever heard anymore. Um, as president, my job would be to, to, in the rebuilding of the party, in leading the rebuilding of the party, to, to develop an equal partnership between, an equal and respectful partnership between the national board representing the membership, caucus, and the leader's office. Caucus hasn't been listened to enough in recent years either. This is the time to do it. The will, I think, the will to, you know, the will to change is there. So, the, the job requirements. Imagine yourself as the search committee for the next CEO. If you're going to be a delegate or voting for delegates at a, uh, at a delegate selection meeting, the pre the next president has to have a real commitment to reform. Uh, I don't know how many candidates there are going to be, anywhere from three to seven. Uh, um, any. Every one of them is going to say, I'm for the grassroots. And every one of them is going to say, I'm, I'm committed to reform. So how do you assess that? Well, if you were in human resources, you'd know that the best predictor of future performance is past performance and the past track record. Track record. So um, ask, uh, uh, find out. When did that person who wants to be president and is speaking about reform actually first start speaking up for reform? Was it on May 3rd? Was it two weeks, two weeks before they, they announced their, their candidacy? I, as I said earlier, I've been speaking up for reform and, and uh, um, producing real, well thought out solutions for, for five years now. Um, the ability to come up with creative solutions. It's not enough just to say, oh yeah, we need to change this and we need to change that. What are you going to change it to? How's it going to be there? Yeah, how are you going to get there? Do they have any experience in doing that kind of thing? You, know, uh, you can kick the tires of my plan by, by going to the website, my campaign website that's listed there, and download it. And, and look exactly at the kinds of things that, that my priorities and the kinds of things that I would address as, as president. It's not written from the, I didn't write it in May as uh, from the point of view of a, of a presidential candidate. It wasn't intended to be part of my campaign. I wrote it as something the party needed, the party needed a plan. What I was hoping was to be able to, to get the national board to to take it as, an, as a starting point, as, as, as a model for discussion, and start a, a consultative process to, to get everybody's idea into a plan. 
They, they haven't done that, so all I can promise at this point is that I would do that. I would have liked to have had it start in May because, you know, in June or Ju July when the National Board last, last met, because if we have to wait until the convention to even start building a plan, we wasted six months of the four and a half years we were given, right? We don't have time to waste. So I'm, I'm deeply disappointed that I couldn't get the, the board to actually seize on the need for, 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 for a, a proper planning process for this party and the need to be, be strategic. Does a person have a proven ability to actually implement things, to make them, to take a plan and, and make it happen? And you know, I've got that track record. In 2008, when, when uh, I did the same thing after the, the election, locally. Um, if, for those of you who don't know, I'm, uh, uh, I was Peter Milliken's riding president, speaker of the house in, in, in Kingston. Um, uh, Peter was accustomed to winning by 20, 30 or more percent margins. Um, it was a squeaker in the, in the last election. And all the trend lines were such that whether or not Peter chose to run again, um, uh, my analysis told me we're going to lose. The conservative is, is going to win unless we reinvent ourselves as a riding association and do very do something very different. So uh, I, I saw the problem. I engaged my my riding executive. Um, I came up with a plan, and I spent two years executing that plan. Uh, part of that was having um, I knew. Uh, two years ago that Peter wasn't going to run again, but it, but it couldn't be made public because he was Speaker of the House and the Leader's Office was, was firm on that. So, so I, you know, uh, but I, I knew that part of the plan was if we, if we had a nomination contest, it would be a clean one. It would be, you know, I would be strictly neutral as running president should be in, 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 in these things. I'd keep it, work to keep it high end. As a result, we got our, we had five strong candidates. We, we um, uh, and the one, the actual, the most, the, the one with the highest public profile, the Dean Law at Queens. Young, engaging, he was good connections with the leader's office. You know, my job was to keep those people at bay so that our members could choose. But they were confident he would win. Um, for various reasons, he didn't. The members chose Ted Shu, our current member of Parliament. Um, and they chose, they chose really well. He's, he's, he's an awesome candidate. But um, the, the, you know, uh, the result was we were one of three ridings in the country to actually increase the Liberal vote from the 2008 election. Um, and from, Peter, from what Peter Melvin garnered, despite the we were one of two ridings in the country to, to elect a new Liberal MP. And we, we actually went against history to do so. Uh, it was the first time in 104 years that a liberal had succeeded a liberal in Kingston. So planning, you know, planning works. That's what we need um, at, the, at the national level. You know. it's, it's a bigger scope, but it's essentially the same task. Reinvent ourselves, uh, work on a, on a well thought through plan, re-engage our members, you know, get, become more relevant to the electorate, which was the biggest part of our, uh, our effort in Kingston. So, um, I'm, uh, uh, I have that proven ability to, um, to implement real solutions to, to organizational cultural change. The next president needs to respect the members far more than mem the members have been respected. Wow. I'm gonna, when I get back to Kingston, we have a button machine in the writing and based on a conversation I had in one of the earlier writings, I'm gonna, Cut myself a button that says no more lip service. <laughs> well, you, you smile, you know what lip service means, right? And we've had too much of it in the last, uh, in, in the last number of years. We, we, we've got to be real. The next president needs a deep understand, needs to hit the ground running with a deep understanding of the realities on the ground, not how they appear from Ottawa, but the reality, or Toronto, but the realities on the ground. Uh, across the whole country. By the time I finished these, these, um, you know, the 180 or so writings that I will visit in the campaign, I will have, uh, I will have had more face time in writings 
with real liberals than any president in recent memory has had during uh, his or her whole term in office. So I'm, I'm, I'm really committed. The next president needs to be full time. It's not a paid position. It's an unpaid volunteer position, just like a writing president. Uh, but I need somebody who has the ability and the commitment to put more than full time into the, into the job. That's what I put into my writing to, uh, to, get, us, to, to, to get us where we were. Um, and the next president will, will um, preside over a leadership contest. Just like a writing president, the national president has to be neutral. It has to be, this contest has to be fair, it has to be high road, it has to be non -divisive. You know, I, I, I know how to do that. Um, the, when you see, I'll just pay, I'll stop now because I, um, I'll just say one, I'll just sort of, for those of you who haven't seen the plan, um, there's, there's, um, I've got a number of, I propose a vision for the party, um, I, and I've got a number of key strategic objectives that, that I would try to achieve. And then if it's me that's president, I would be trying to achieve it during my presidency. I can't, you can't, nobody can do this themselves, but they can lead the, the, the doing. Revamping our governance, that's, that's a starting, that's something that all of the other objectives require. Uh, we need to we need to be more open. We need to be transparent. We need to be fair, and we we can't convince Canadians that that we're going to bring democratic renewal to uh, the country if we don't practice it in our own, our own house. And one of my biggest uh, one of my biggest targets would be the nomination process, which has which has cost us more writings than anything I can think of in terms of unfair. Um, manipulated um, uh, costs. We can't afford that kind of stuff anymore. It has to be. It has to be over. Um, I work with the new national policy chair to ensure that our policy process was more dynamic, uh, was was real in terms of re really reflecting the values of our, our of our members and the ideas of our members across the country, and that it. It produced a, a you know a comprehensive, inspiring suite of policies that will engage Canadians. Um, I'd work to make us a more effective volunteer organization. We don't have many. Uh, uh, the leader's office, for example, is down from 90, 90 full-time staff positions under Mr. Nanny to fifteen under Mr. Ray. That's not necessarily a bad thing. The, you know, the 15 might be more effective than the 90, but, but the party apparatus has been cut back as well. And there's a lot of things to be done that, that we don't have the people to do. But yeah, we have so many liberals across the country who've got skills, experience, ideas, enthusiasm, that would be that you know, we've never tapped. We've never made use of, the, of, of, of what they have. You know, we've got to start in now. Hi. Can I just take your seat? No, yes. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I'm standing. Okay. Um, we've, got to, we've got to rebuild the liberal base nationally. And I talk about how to do that in that planning document that you, that you can download. But it has to be done from the ground up. It has, and it has to bear in mind that every riding is different. We have to help ridings rebuild their base. We have to we have to get them and help them get involved on lo and identifying local issues that have real traction. We have to build new vote, voter code, new uh, national voter coalitions to replace the ones we've lost. And it starts from the people you talk to in this riding to find out what matters to them that will you know, influence their voice. And finally. We need to communicate well. Um, our, our communications has all been tactical. I've, um, I have some experience in trying to, in, I know I'm not a public relations PR person. I have some experience doing that in Kingston. We were very successful despite 
like you, having all our local media being conservative owned. But we got our message across it. And we managed to combat the, uh, the conservative messaging quite effectively. Whenever, whenever I tried to engage the uh, communications directors in either the leader's office or the party, head, party headquarters, their views were entirely tactical. They were looking at what was happening today in Parliament, and you know, their, plan, their largest planning horizon seemed to be like the middle of next week. Uh, the Conservatives have a long-range plan. They executed extremely well. They didn't do it all themselves. They, you know, their, their Republican <coughs> mentors, masters, <laughs> perfected this a long time ago. We haven't made any attempts to counter that in a liberal way that, not, that, uh, that reflects liberal values. Uh, we, we need to do strategic communications and we need to do it consistently. So, um, I can, I've been saying that the party needs to listen more, the president needs to listen more, so I've been talking too much, I'll listen now. Uh, I'd love to hear your ideas, your questions, your thoughts. That is a, a couple of things, and thank you very much for, <coughs> excuse me, of course, as the cold weather of September begins to set in. Um, you've indicated, very accurately, of course, that you're not directly as president involved in policy setting. But I, I, I think we'd be interested to know precisely how you would see new policy directions being developed and what your role would be in that. That's the first comment. The second is that you know, I think many of us would argue that, in fact, the Liberal Party platform in the last election was frankly an outstanding mm -hmm. the, the, the problem was not the it was, it was rolled out effectively, it was done early, unlike in 2008 and 2004, or six rather. Um, it had, I think, some problems for Alberta, for Alberta liberals at least, for a range of reasons, which I think is, in spite of Jack Lee, is one of the reasons the NDP did much better here than mm -hmm. in this riding, frankly, than we would have anticipated. But, um, so the problem wasn't that, it, it was that people were not resonating with either the message that was in that in that campaign in the return, nor did they really believe in the liberal message as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts are. You're talking about strategic transformation, new directions, etc. You know, in a concrete way without looking at your website yet. Um, what what you think needs to be done, not just as president, but by the party as a as a whole nationally in order to address regional differences, mm -hmm. which are fundamental, as you know. You know, we are not a seat-rich area <coughs> southern, mm -hmm. uh, that southern Ontario is, but um, nonetheless, there's, a, I think, a sense here that the policy directions tend to write off Alberta. Mm -hmm. And as long as that is the general direction of the, of the policies, whether it's on oil sands or on environmental issues, mm -hmm. what have you, um, it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. So how do you develop that kind of regional diversity which still resonates across the country as a real national uh, platform? And who does it? Okay. <laughs> now that's, that's many questions. In I know. Oh, yeah. so, so let me, let me take... We don't have a lot of time to ask you these questions. I mean, <laughs> and she's not recording the answers we were told. So. <laughs> she's not recording my... Definitely <laughs> recording your, your, your questions. The... Um, the role of the president isn't to dictate the policies. Like, just like a good policy chair doesn't sit down and, and write policies, they, they basically in, encourage and facilitate members' voices be it being heard. So, you know, if the if the memberships, if, if you know, um, I, I, I see my role as representing the members of the party and helping them get them, doing what it takes to get them to where they, they want to be, not to impose my, my, my personal ideas. The policy process needs to be revamping so that it's, it is more responsive. Um, currently, it's a two-year cycle um, with resolutions that, that are usually more than a year old by the time they eventually make it to a biennial convention. Uh, the world moves faster than that now. So we have to find a way of engaging people in discussions. And it's, it is going to require more use of online 
because you can't afford to bring people from across the country uh, together. The, 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 the lead role on that is the National Policy Chair. But I would, I would certainly be, you know, be helping that person, uh, mentoring them. Um, and the most important role is to make sure that where the president's most important role in the policy process is to make sure that the output is listened to. That it's not just um, ignored the day, from the day, after, the day after the convention. And that means engaging with the leader's office, engaging with the policy, with, the, with caucus, and making sure that, that the platform, you know, it's the, the leader always has the lead, lead role on what's contained in the platform policy. The, the uh, caucus has a lot to do with it. But the prop, it's supposed to draw on what, what uh, members have. You know, mem member values, member uh, ideas, and so on. And that's the piece that's been missing for way too long. Because in a, in a platform after platform, it's been ignored. So, so that's one piece of it. The um, uh, in, ter in terms of, of the regional, I'm, I've been learning a lot as I've crossed the prairies about how you know. Uh, I mean, the obvious one is gun control. The, the, uh, that's cost us more, more in the prairies than anything since the national energy policy. The liberals I've been talking to um, in rural Manitoba and Saskatchewan, Alberta, haven't been telling me you've got to do, with, do away with the gun registry. What they've been saying is you've got to actually involve us um, and, and our communities and sit down with, with, with the unarmed rural gun owners and work through how that policy could be amended to, to, to work in the West. And I think that's a great example of, of, of what, what, should be, what should be done um, in, in policies nationally. It's not, enough, it's not just enough to get a consensus <coughs> on the policy, it's also, it also requires a more two-way discussion to tailor them so that they work in all the regions. Now, what did I miss of the question? No, you didn't, no, you didn't, miss, you didn't miss anything except for the fact that, or the question, uh, why what was essentially a very good platform, wow. very good platform did not resonate. There was also no um, credibility to the notion um, of the um, contempt of Parliament. There was, no, there was no capacity to sell that to voters here. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious why you think that was the case. It was true in Ontario, it was true in it was certainly true across the prairies in Alberta. Well, one of my thoughts on that is that uh, after Mr. Agnadio became leader, the Conservatives carefully framed him mm -hmm. as just visiting. Mm -hmm. And it worked, and it worked, and it worked. <coughs> they were never fought back. I guess they didn't have the resources. So voters out there, the average voter, when they think about voting in the election, are they going to vote for a guy that's just visiting here, here to try something new? So they didn't. They voted they didn't vote or didn't vote or voted conservative. Yeah, but the issue, the issue here is, <coughs> was the contempt of the parliament uh, question as opposed to not his leadership. And um, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, what you would do, because you talked about communication, which are yes. critically, critically important. How do you communicate more effectively the message on, for example, the contempt of parliament issue mm -hmm. than was done the last time? I mean, we had liberals that didn't believe this, never mind some of the conservative and NDP voters. Well, let me answer this a, a bit uh, uh, before I lose the uh, before I lose the thread there. Um, part, part of it is is uh, poor communications. We we don't understand as a party how to get that message across through the noise that the conservatives are, uh, are generating. There are techniques to do that. We had we had some successes in Kingston that way. We, uh, you know, when the when the conservative candidate resorted to attack ads against our candidate, we responded not with uh, by by basically when we were subject to we were also subject to the dirty tricks of the you know phone calls to, to uh, voters at two in the morning representing themselves as from our uh, as being from our campaign office. And very sophisticated. The caller name display showed our campaign office. So this was not this was. You know, there was a lot of money behind this, behind that. 
we, uh, I use the analogy of, of judo. We didn't have the money that our, the conservatives had. We tried, when they, when they did things that were distasteful in, in the ads, we called them on it consistently. And through, through uh, and not through sort of the same paid ads, through viral emails, through, through, through other channels. And, and our goal was always to cost them more, uh, to have those actions cost them more votes than the, than the game. Use their strength, use your opponent's strengths, uh, you know, against them. Our party's never done it. Central party has never done anything like that. But a more direct answer to your, your question is, is most people did not understand the liberal platform. Um, you know, uh, I, I had a really articulate member who's, who, who uh, one of my executives, who said, you know, she was at a family gathering. She and her brother died in little, little liberals. You know, they're they're like, you know, she's she's working on a PhD. He's working on a master's. You know, they're they're bright, and they were asked, what is the liberal? Come on now, okay, you're here now. Tell us, what does the liberal party really stand for? And they will say, um, um, one said, um, um, well, well, uh, learning passport. The other said, um, 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 family card. <laughs> Red and eight. And I said, at that point, I realized we were the only dog you do in this. So the, the platform had really good stuff in it, but it didn't really address the problems that people have in their, in their own lives. Certain groups of people, but, 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 but not generally. And, um, the members weren't provided with, with a good, um, with, with uh, really, you know, explain, uh, expl it wasn't explained to members in which, in a way that they could explain it to their, to their fellow citizens very well. And one, one last thing on that point before we go to the others, what, what I would do differently is I would engage the liberals in writing associations across the country in the process. When a new when a new communicate you know when a new communication strategy or a new, new policy that um, a new policy is going to um, going to uh, is going to be announced um, and there's a communication strategy for it. I'd like to actually develop a network of liberals across the country who are who are good at this sort of thing to uh, to take that, that planned communication and try it on their neighbors right? and give us feedback. Uh, does that message work? And, and even go beyond that to, to, um, to say, try it in a different, if, if they see it's not working, can they come up with a way that does work in, the, in their community, in, in their neighborhood? And feed that back to Ottawa. Because time and time again, you get a you know you get a um, a new communicate you know a new set of ads coming out of Ottawa at great cost and you look at them and you know immediately they're not going to work but from the Ottawa bubble you know they do they, 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 you know the group think uh, in the leader's office yeah boy we've got it but they don't test it you know except in their sort of their focus groups up there but. There's, there's ways of doing better. So I think you raised your hand first. Oh, yeah, I just want to say, I think in terms of why like the platform didn't, or, like, didn't really resonate, I think a lot of it has to do with what you said, uh, finance and raising money, mm -hmm. because, I mean, like running those television ads and radio ads and newspaper ads, that costs money. And also to help you know, get the, the focus groups together to kind of focus our message uh, accurately, because the Tories, I mean, they were great at you know, at like like when uh, say the uh, contempt of parliament, they didn't stick with that. They went with the economy thing. The most Canadians probably care more about keeping their jobs mm -hmm. and get us keeping their houses rather than what goes on in parliament. Mm -hmm. And I think they knew that because you know they they've done the research and they have the staff to do that. So I think we need to improve fundraising. I think it should be the most like important thing that the Liberal Party needs to focus on in the next five years because we need the money to compete with the Conservatives. Yeah, but but. But it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah, and yeah. we have this fundamental problem with fundraising now: mm -hmm. is that we're now down to third-party status, yeah. and it's hard to convince people that this that investing in us is, in yeah. is, is a good is a good investment. Exactly, and I think that's where the grassroots comes in, because you can show people that you know they have a say in the party, and that's the right reason to give to the party. So I just I like to resolve ourselves. But in the in the meantime, 
until we have that funding, um, we can't afford the level of focus groups yeah. that the Conservatives have. Yeah. But we have a lot of Liberals around the country who do a damn good job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, these are sort of how that I'm, as a presidential candidate, I'd like you to make a champion if you agree. First of all, uh, my writing president once said, and I agree with him, is there a way that we can do fundraising that's direct withdrawal from checking or savings accounts? There's a lot of people that don't like to put money on their credit card. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing we really have to look into, and if we can, we, we need to get that out. Uh, I run into that a lot. I was a candidate in Calgary Southeast that do these honor of writing against Jason King. Okay. Um, we owe you. <laughs> number two, how am I going to be Jason King? Um, we, we talk about communications. Um, with my writing association, we're all volunteers, everybody's busy. Kids, jobs, life, everything. I've written a proposal which I'm in the middle of changing to the whereas and the be a result that uh, Don Lentzberger, our self regional chair, has received a base copy of what I'm going to suggest. Hopefully, that's going to win. Basically, we need to set, if it takes a constitutional change, to create the position of future nomination candidates. These are people that can come to an EDA and say, I'm looking at rent. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're not having a nomination meeting for another year and a half. Mm -hmm. well, we need people on the ground now hosting these policy events, mm -hmm. showing, being shadowed cabinet ministers, writing the press releases locally. Mm -hmm. And so we should look at creating a position of future nomination candidates. Um, basically, it's anyone who, anyone, cartier member who's eligible to run should be able to apply to be one of these people. Prove you want the job. Mm -hmm. Fundraise. Because mm -hmm. we need it. All money raised goes to the EDA and however it's mm -hmm. split up. Number two, acts as a shadow cap, uh, shadow MP in our 274 riding succession. Let, the other thing we need to do in Alberta is we need to get away from plant the flag or hold the flag or parachuting candidates that are just holding the flag in rural Alberta. We need to set up a two, three year, and this one's, if you're setting up a strategy, mm -hmm. For four years and then beyond, this will fit right in. Is mm -hmm. if you have five people fundraising and one be a candidate, so be it. We, we have to be careful with the writ and the elections Canada rules on this, but mm -hmm. that's where we have a lawyer somewhere in our yeah. association. I'm sure. I, I know it works because we did it. Okay. So, but we need to do this on a national level, and it needs to be pushed from. Mm -hmm. uh, I I know people don't like this, the ivory tower of the executive, but it needs to be pushed down through the national level, down to the provincial, to the EDAs, provincial territorial associations, to the EDAs. Because these people you know, are going to have to have some reins on them, so to make sure that they're not embarrassing the liberal public. That's the one yet big thing I'm looking for. Um, this puts someone on the ground who's basically doing a four-year internship or more running, trying to get paying jobs. Yes. And this is what we need, and if you've done that already, great. Um, yeah. I, I was talking about the, the, you know, the pre-rate fundraising and, and all, all of yeah. that. Um, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, you, I, I was a little cautious when you started speaking until you, until you clarified your, uh, your, your idea would allow for multiple such candidates yes. in a riot. Yes. Because it has to. It's, uh, that, that's critical. I, I don't think it's such a big issue here in Alberta, but in Ontario yes. and Quebec. You know, yes. I, I can testify that a, uh, a clean, contested nomination race and real late boosts you know, public interest in, in, in the riding. Yes. If it can possibly be contested, as long as you, 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 you sit the candidates down and get them to swear, I'm glad that they'll, they'll uh, that it'll be clean and uh, yeah, and respectful, and um, and that they all swear that whoever wins, they will, they will support that person. Because officially, with this position, they're not really running for anything. Yet. They're just considering to run, and that allows them to. Yeah. Even then, as I as I think I alluded to, as a uh, as a writing president myself, one of my who was having a yes. nomination contest, one of my, my one of my biggest jobs I saw was to keep the outside power brokers out of my riding so that our members chose. 
How many card carrying members are there in the party right now in the country? Um, I think it's, it, I was really worried earlier in the year, but it's actually bounced up again after the, the election. So um, I think we're probably approaching, um, uh, probably approaching about 70,000 now, at least 60, sometimes 70. The party doesn't announce it, so I, I, you know, I have to get it through the back door. But uh, it's, it's up in the 60 to 70 range now, which is pretty, still pretty low, but it's, it's, um, we, uh, we have been losing, in the last six years, we've been losing about 10 to 15,000 members a year. You know, uh, you, you it's know, always concealed know. because it bounces around so much during, during the course of the year. You know, it goes up and up. Oh, yeah, we're, and they only, they'll only announce it when it's going up and up and up. And then, of course, it plummets on January 1st. But the, the reality has been a, a pretty steady downward slope. See, see, the thing I kind of trouble gets my head around is the fact that, say, even if you consider 50% of that uh, <coughs> that number, mm -hmm. if they gave the sort of bottom line contribution which gets you the maximum of 75%, we would not have a financial problem. Mm -hmm. And and I, I mean, my personal, uh, I guess my personal epiphany came after the 2006 election. Uh, and I started then, I just canceled my victory fund con uh, contribution because I want to see where the, the whole scenario goes as far as the, uh, the people that are after the job you're after and also where the, uh, I'm, I'm looking to see where the, uh, where the leadership, what direction the leadership contest takes. And, uh, you know, it, it's like, I can honestly say I, I, the reason I stopped was I felt I was sending good money after bad. Well, you can, you can certainly donate, you know, you can, you can uh, rather than just dropping the uh, picture card, you can also switch, swap your donations. To the well, I, I, I right messed around with it. I sent it to Eastern, uh, I, I donated to Eastern constituencies. I, ne I, I never did give any to my own constituency. Uh, but I, I gave it to Eastern constituency and I sent it to, some to Ottawa and then I twisted it around. But I still sent the money. <laughs> there, was a, there was a question here, I think. Were you? Well, I was just going to say, I agree with you when you were asking why the platform didn't go, because they didn't make it relevant to people in their everyday lives.